serpents, large cats found in the Middle Ages. But equally as terrifying as monsters of myth, some believe a real animal has survived beyond the prehistoric past, escaped extinction, and still walks the earth. The difference is that Megalania could have lived in swamps, could have got away. You know, it was a different animal altogether. It was a scavenger. Historian Peter Hancock says Aboriginal elders tell stories of a giant lizard swimming into the ocean and fighting with one of the sea's most ferocious animals. Somehow or other, he gets on the wrong side of the great white shark, and uh, the great white shark attacks him, and they have a fight, and Megalania drags himself ashore. But these are still bright, vibrant stories from something that supposedly was the last big carnivore and predator that they ever had to deal with thousands of years ago. And you'd think the memories had fade, but they haven't. And the impression being that they were around until quite recently. Rex Gilroy is convinced they still are. Definitely. I've got the cast tracks. Aided by Australian Gary Opit and American reptile expert Tony Gerard. Gilroy is deep in the Walami National Forest in search of the giant, Megalania. You've got to be silent in the bush if you're going to find anything. A big search party gets nowhere most times. The vast vegetation and thick underbrush make it a perfect habitat for an ambush predator. One of the, the best ways of finding evidence uh, of, uh, of the animal life in any locality is to simply move through those areas that have a nice sandy soil and they leave quite uh, distinct tracks. In addition to tracking the creature, they have a plan to lure it in. Gary and I plan to put out some camera traps with some, um, some meat for bait. Monitor lizards, in addition to being predators, or, or active scavengers. They approach an area where visitors to the National Forest reported something large moving through the trees in the winter of 2003. It actually walked right through this locality, uh, and they were so amazed that uh, a couple of them wanted to actually follow the animal. Opit believes it's a good location to place the bait. Here we have some nice pieces of beef, good enough to throw on the barbie, but uh, we're going to see if we can attract uh, uh, a giant goanna. Like other monitor lizards, Megalania would have an incredible sense of smell and be able to detect the scent of meat from more than one mile away. We'd like to set them up where, um, maybe a little bit high, where, where the, uh, the wind is going to carry the smell of our bait, because a uh, monitor can pick up on carrying type smell from, from quite a ways away. Cameras will be positioned to record images of anything that attempts to take the bait. How does that look, Gary? High twice. Uh, yeah, that yeah. looks great. All right. That looks good. The team moves on to find a location for their second camera trap. This is where we found the last batch of tracks uh, about 12 months ago, so I'm always confident we're going to find something around here. That looks pretty good. Good open area. The edge between two communities, you get the most amount of action, you've got more sunlight coming in, better variety of vegetation. And we'll put in a couple of baits here, so we're gonna have one, yeah, one about that high, and then one a bit lower. With the cameras in place, the team heads back into the forest to continue the search for tracks and other signs. As they make their way through the brush, Gerard notices something about the habitat that suggests that they are on the right track to finding a possible giant reptile. Termite mounds, uh, in a way, are related to the monitor lizards, and a lot of monitor lizards lay their eggs in termite mounds. Uh, they excavate a a chamber uh, down inside, lay the eggs, and the termites come and repair around it. Um, termite mounds stay remarkably temperature constant on the inside, so it's great for, uh, for egg incubation. The lack of a viable breeding population has long been an argument against the existence of Megalania today. And critics cite it as a major factor against the existence of most cryptid creatures. But a recent discovery could turn that argument upside down. Megalania's modern relatives, Komodo dragons, can multiply without a mate.
called parthenogenesis. It is the process of producing offspring without male fertilization, and it has surprised the experts. There are a handful of, of reptiles out there that do reproduce parthenogenically. Uh, it came as a big shock, I think, to most people that Komodos were capable of doing it. Nate Nelson is the head zookeeper for Sedgwick County Zoo in Wichita, Kansas. The zoo's newest Komodo dragon was hatched parthenogenically. He's a parthenogenic offspring. He was produced without the genetic input of a father. And that means the female lays eggs, which then develop normally without fertilization from a male. Nelson says the females can lay up to 20 or more eggs. Of those, not all are fertile. And of course, only the fertile ones hatch. There is reason to believe that dragons at other zoos are reproducing parthenogenically. We're just not keeping the eggs. The zoo recently incubated some of the eggs and produced these two hatchlings. Uh, at this size right now, this, this dragon is really fast, really agile. Uh, and that's an adaptation for getting up in trees and away from the predatory big adults. And they'll live up in the tree for up to a year. But does this mean Megalania could maintain a population through parthenogenesis? Nelson points out a problem with that theory. It would be impossible to get a female because you cannot get the chromosome combination that makes a female. So reproduction without a male is possible, but only for a generation at a time. Still, believers maintain that a large population wouldn't be needed to support a species if that species was concentrated in a small area with sufficient food supply and places to hide. The Walemi National Forest is just such a place. And there may be others. If history supports the possibility of monster lizards in Australia, could other nearby lands with populations of large reptiles also harbor giants? Indonesia may hold the answer, where the world's largest known dragons live today. Indonesia, a cluster of 17,508 islands in Southeast Asia, of which only about 6,000 are populated. Of those, Five are home to a known living relative to Megalania, the deadly Komodo dragon. Is there a top-line predator? There's nothing bigger or badder. Trooper Walsh is a retired biologist from the Smithsonian National Zoo. He has spent his life researching the Komodo dragon. Really, the worst thing about a Komodo dragon bite is whatever they bite, it's probably going to come off. You know, so if you're bitten on the arm, they can just rip your arm off. Unknown to the Western world until 1910, and named dragons because of their semblance to the creatures of legend, these carnivorous reptiles are the largest known lizard alive today. Komodo dragons were first identified by Lieutenant Van Stein van Hunsbroek, a member of the occupying Dutch colonials. Rumors of a creature over 20 feet long spurred van Hunsbroek's curiosity. Komodo dragons Males are larger than females, but a large male might be nine, nine and a half feet long and weigh upwards of 200, a fat one would be 250 pounds. The largest Komodo dragon on record measured 10 feet long and weighed 365 pounds, one third the size of Megalania. There was probably a common ancestor to both of those lizards, Megalania and Komodo dragons, that uh, may have been around when they were dinosaurs. But could Komodo dragons grow to the size of Megalania? It seems that these animals mutate quickly. So, for instance, it, it might only take uh, two or three generations for them to get larger. The prospect of a Komodo dragon the size of Megalania is a fearsome one. Even without a mutation, at an average size of eight feet, Komodo dragons are terrifying predators. They're both aggressive predators, meaning they'll go out and, and search for food, but then they're also ambush predators. These animals will feed on anything, again, including their own kind, and animals as large as water buffalo, deer, wild pigs, snakes. Among the hunted are human beings.
In June 2007, Komodo Village became the scene of a horrific attack. The day began just like any other day. Kids playing and kicking around a soccer ball. No one could imagine that just 100 feet behind the village, tragedy was about to strike. Leaving the game momentarily to relieve himself, an eight-year-old boy ran into the nearby shrub. He had no idea a killer Komodo dragon was lurking in the bushes. The dragon knocked over the young boy and began to attack him. The boy's uncle heard the scream. The boy was screaming and asking for help. From the distance, I didn't realize the boy was beaten by the dragon. Then when I got closer, I saw the dragon biting the boy. The uncle quickly picked up a handful of rocks and started throwing them at the dragon. I wasn't scared. I was just concerned about the boy and his safety. After repeatedly hitting the dragon with stones, the uncle eventually chased it off. After I threw a few stones and the dragon left, I picked up the boy and took him to the nurse. I carried the boy to the nearest place like a hospital, but before I arrived, the boy had already passed away. And dangerous attacks continued. In June of 2008, a Swedish diver marooned on the island of Rincha faced off against a Komodo dragon. Komodo dragons like this one can kill buffalo and deer with their strong jaws. The dragon the divers encountered seemed hungry. It's a wetsuit in its mouth. So Kath, the other lady, got a stick. Uh, and this is a Komodo dragon. Kath was fighting off with a stick. Me and Helena were throwing um, boulders at it. Encountering Van Hensbroek's rumored 20-foot beast would mean certain death. Monster Quest has mobilized a team of researchers to search the island of Rincher to find a giant Komodo dragon. Jerry Emantra and Ahmed Arifiendi are researchers for the Komodo Survival Program. They have been working with Komodo dragons for seven years. Together with a team of park rangers, they will travel by boat three hours to Rincher Island, which is located in eastern Indonesia. So we need a lot of people and a lot of gears, you know, because we will stay maybe for weeks or maybe sometimes we can take two months in the field, so we need a lot of gear. The team's first concern as they set foot on shore is with their own safety. Because sometimes Komodo dragons come to attack us. I mean, in case Komodo dragons take us, so we can hold the animal like this to chase the dragon away. The wide open savanna on Rincha makes it fairly easy to see Komodo dragons in the distance. Within minutes, Ahmed spots several underneath the ranger post. Uh, I saw a big, a big males underneath the ranger post. It's quite big. I think it's a, uh, it's males, adult males. Rangers live on the island year-round. To protect themselves from unwanted visitors at night, the houses are raised up. And during the hot summer months, Komodo dragons are often found under the houses in the shade. Maybe the dragon smells food from the ranger station, so they came here quite a lot, and they get used to see humans, so they're not really afraid of humans. There are several of the creatures lurking in the village. The cool morning air means the animals are sleeping, which allows the researchers to brave close proximity. But when it's active, by 9 o'clock they become active, I can get this close to the animals. It's a hopeful sign. Uh, we'll find a bigger one, the biggest one if we can find. They begin their search past the ranger stations in the forested area of the island. As the sun rises higher in the sky, the temperature rises. 
then a possible food source. 